companies were formed um, so wealthy individuals could hide their, um, their, their ill-gotten wealth or maybe legitimate wealth as well. Um, it, was, um, it was in fact that most number of these companies were set up in the British Virgin Islands um, and more than half of that was in British overseas territories, not just Panama. And then it was also the story of the intermediaries who were again found across the world. Um, intermediaries like the accountants and lawyers who were working on behalf of their anonymous clients and giving instructions to this law firm that was based in Panama. And again, if you look at kind of the picture on the left, um, these intermediaries were found um, across the world. Um, and then, of course, it was a story of the actual individuals who were trying to hide their wealth. Um, and again, these individuals were found across the world. Um, so this was very much a global problem um, and we needed these leaks uh, because secrecy is what they all depend on um, to make this, work, uh, make this work for them. So this showed us that there were around two, over 200,000 offshore entities across 200 countries, 12 national leaders and over 140 politicians were implicated, which gives an indication of why this is such a difficult issue to work on and, and expect change because we're looking to the same politicians to plug these loopholes and several of them are actually benefiting from this system. Um, and in addition, you know, there were businessmen, football players, you know, movie stars, so on. Um, you know, we talked about addressing inequality. These are some of the most privileged people in all of our societies. Um, so if we're going to address inequality, this might be a good place to start because it seems like there's a different set of rules um, that operates for them. And this isn't just a story of, of course, just revenue losses. Um, it's also about kind of human rights and implications for gender justice. Um, one, of the, one of the case studies that came to light was how an alleged ringleader of a human trafficking network um, who was exploiting you know, underage girls, this, this network, uh, was also a client of Mossack Fonseca, the same law firm that was based in Panama. Um, I suppose it's pretty relevant that all the 12 national leaders are all men. <laughs> Um, and then we move on to, so Panama Papers was largely the story of how individuals um, were using the system to hide their wealth. Um, and then we move on to the scandals that were associated with how multinational corporations were dodging taxes. Um, we had the LuxLeaks, uh, which showed us how hundreds of companies were able to secure secret deals from Luxembourg to reduce their taxes, some to even less than 1% uh, on, on their profits. Many of these tax deals exploited international tax mismatches, which allowed them to not be paying taxes anywhere. Um, and again, there's the role of intermediaries in this. In this case, it was accounting firms, most notably the role of the big four. Um, so PricewaterhouseCoopers helped multinational companies obtain over 500 such rulings. Um, so those were the leaks, and then of course we've seen a lot of standalone scandals of Apple, Google, Amazon, Starbucks, Dell, and so on, who have avoided uh, paying taxes, little to no taxes. Um, and of course, these were not just stories of island tax havens, and Alex mentioned that in, in his presentation. It's also about you know, jurisdictions such as Ireland, um, such as Netherlands, Luxembourg, um, who are very much also operating as, as tax havens. Then we had Swiss leaks, um, which was again a leak of, um, of, uh, of residents who had bank accounts in one branch of HSBC in Switzerland. Um, and of course, a lot of, the, a lot of the headlines at the time was about the, the kind of the amounts of money um, of various citizens of countries that were held in, in that bank. But when you look at it as a percentage of GDP, um, it's actually developing countries who were disproportionately affected. Um, so this is essentially a system that you know, depends on the financial secrecy. Developing countries are disproportionately affected, and this is a global problem. In terms of human rights implications, I mentioned about the case study with the Panama Papers, um, and again, Alex already mentioned it, but when you have a system which allows for this sort of uh, tax avoidance and evasion by uh, corporations and high net worth individuals, governments are then forced to depend on much more regressive taxes, um, where the burden of which falls the hardest on the poor, especially the women. Um, and then there is the often heard excuse for why they can't pay for better health care, better education and so on, because they can't afford it as governments. Um, so there is, um, and I know there will be a separate session on gender and tax tomorrow, but the linkages are important. 
So we know secrecy is central, uh, so obviously the answer would be that we need more transparency in, in, this, in this system, um, and we need global solutions. Yet, despite all of the outrage, our current solutions are neither about transparency and nor are they global. Um, in fact, we're in the strange scenario where transparency is getting defined or redefined to mean transparency to authorities and not really about transparency to the public or transparency to members of parliament, journalists, investors, and so on. Um, so some of the key measures, um, for instance, which are the key measure by OECD, which would reveal profit shifting by multinational corporations, which is country by country reporting, is not public. It's only going to be transparent to authorities. Uh, the same thing with the global standard on identifying real owners of companies and legal entities, which was the crux of the problem with Panama Papers, again, that would not be public. Um, and then there is the actual process of how these standards get designed, um, which is led by, again, Alex mentioned it, <laughs> so, um, which is being led by a handful of um, high-income countries um, and G20 countries. So all non-G20 developing countries are excluded from this process. Um, so in addition to OECD's international tax standard setting processes, uh, it's important to also look at the Financial Action Task Force, um, which designs the anti-money laundering standards, uh, international anti-money laundering standards. And again, those were standards that were set by the same OECD and G20 governments, but all countries are expected to implement it. So they say it's global, but it's only global in its implementation, but it's not global in designing the agenda or actually designing the standards. Um, and there's actually an interesting example by an academic who, who looked at how kind of FATF um, anti-money laundering standards were being implemented in developing countries. And um, the government of Mali, for instance, uh, was told that they now need to implement these standards. Um, and they said, the government said, well, you know, they're not all relevant for us, so can we adapt them to our context? Um, and the response was, well, that would mean that you're not actually meeting these international standards, which means you will be blacklisted, and then it will be very hard to attract investment and so on. Um, so essentially, they did as they were told to do. Um, and we're seeing very much the same process with OECD, where the countries were not at the table to design the standards, but now would be forced to implement, or again, they'll find themselves on blacklists and so on. So yeah, so that's the question. I mean. Uh, can we have a system that's much more democratic than what it is currently? And coming back to the issue of institution, I mean, it's not about UN versus OECD or EU, but it's about the principles on which international cooperation um, operates. Um, and I think some of these principles are key uh, when we're kind of fighting for better processes, whether it's universal and democratic, which means is every government get a vote and can citizens hold their government accountable for what they're doing or not doing uh, in, these, uh, in these processes? Is it transparent to the public? Uh, is it essentially just uh, discussions behind closed doors and us being told that everything is fixed? Or can we actually be part of these negotiating tracks um, and, and, and hold governments accountable while the process is unfolding? And is it neutral on the issues, or do they have membership they need to please? I mean, if it's OECD, they already have membership they need to please. It's not a neutral platform. Um, which is why, I mean, we've been very supportive of the developing country's proposal to have a UN intergovernmental tax body, and we're certainly very supportive of uh, Ecuador's leadership role uh, in G77 this year. With that, I think I'll, I'll stop my presentation, and I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you.